You are listening to Animated Indulgence, the explicit and opinionated podcast where grown men talk about cartoons. Each episode, we'll pick apart, analyze, and dissect an animated series or movie. Warning, there will be spoilers, even potentially for shows and movies that are not the topic at hand. We may watch cartoons, but we don't watch our language. Discretion is advised. Welcome, listeners, to episode four of Animated Indulgence, where grown men watch cartoons. This week, we are tackling Disney's Gravity Falls. I am Airhammer. I'm Deus. And I'm a Jork. So, uh, yeah, should we just uh, jump right into it? Yeah. Where should we begin? Uh, well, spoiler-free. Yeah, spoiler-free, uh, spoiler-free pitch. This, f- right off the bat, I'm going to say this show is going to be hard to pitch spoiler-free. But, yeah, we, we'll try our best. So, who wants to lead? I'll lead. Uh, the general idea sure. of the show is that it is a paranormal adventure of two kids spending the summer with their great uncle and his uh, tourist trap somewhere out in the middle of the woods in, in Oregon. Oregon. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's yeah definitely a mystery show. Lots of mm-hmm. lots of uh, secrets going on. In the very first episode, it's shown that, you know, Uncle Stan isn't doesn't you know everything's not all as it seems with Uncle Stan. He has a secret going on, and Dipper finds this mysterious journal. Lots and lots and lots of uh, secrets in the show. Lots of uh, stuff hidden that becomes relevant later. Yeah, it's very much a mystery show. Yeah, it starts out pretty simple, and then everything goes crazy. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. the best of it. Yeah, lots of conspiracy, but I would paint it more as a paranormal adventure. As much as the mystery is there and nagging at you, what you see on the screen is usually more of a, not quite Scooby-Doo, but it feels a lot like Scooby-Doo, where there's a ghost and they have to find some sort of weird, unconventional means to exercise it or some such. Yeah, usually by the uh, help from with help but from the journal. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned Scooby-Doo because it to me it's very much like if you took a Saturday morning cartoon, you know, something like Recess or Rugrats or Cat Dog or you know, you know, Saturday morning like episodic cartoon, mixed it with a dash of uh, Scooby-Doo and a dash of X Files, and that's what you got. It's good. It's interesting. It's different. I've never watched anything quite like it. I'm sure we will over the course of the show, but I've never seen anything quite like it. I got to have a lot of influences for this show. Uh, it certainly does have that feel to it. And it's very episodic in a way where most of the threats are tackled within the episode, leaving the main story to go on and continue through whatever uh, the aftermath of the episode was. Like I said, like uh, which is something that is v- identical to the way uh, the, the, the stories are fr- uh, structured in X-Files. The vast I don't think major- we're giving right. it uh, a fair shake, but the premise is absolutely wonderful. Yeah. You follow these two children, uh, 12-year-olds, and they're adventuring through the forest, through the wilderness, this small, sleepy town with lots of rich history, uh, a tight-knit community, lots of secrets that are very, very hidden below the surface. It is very, very good premise. Uh, the execution might not be as good as the premise, but it is more than passable. It's a very enjoyable show. I would say it's probably a modern classic. Yeah. Uh, I guess another thing we should say for the, anyone uh, that might find this relevant is that it is a complete show. It is done its run. It has two seasons, which we'll be reviewing here, and it's done. It came to a conclusion. It has an ending. That you I mean they they might do something again in the universe later, but that will be its own story, like something uh, Cor- oh. Legend of Korra esque compared to Avatar. Yeah, it's definitely set up for a sequel or even a movie. Yeah, it'll just be interesting to see if we actually ever get those. But mm-hmm. I would be content not to, because I I like where it ended. But yeah, that's for let me ask Atlanta. you guys, how did you guys find the humor? Because for me, I think it hit the mark about twice per episode. Which, for a kid's show, is pretty good. That's a good par. Uh, yeah, I... It's, I got lots I, of laughs like, out of it. Yeah, I got... I, there's lots of funny stuff, particularly with Mabel. Mabel's kookiness. But, uh, and Seuss, I... Oh, Seuss is always good for a good chuckle, in my opinion. 
But yeah, maybe we should describe the characters a bit before we should move on. Would you guys uh, care uh, yeah. to describe uh, uh, a couple? Yeah. Characters, characters. There's a lot to talk about with characters. Um, How about the main cast first? Uh, yeah, Mabel Dipper. Pine, since we, yeah, Mabel, Dipper and Mabel since we talked about brother her. and sister. Go yeah, ahead, they sorry. are the twins, Dipper and Mabel Pines. Mabel is an effervescent, sparkling, almost manic young woman who is living in an enchanted fantasy world inside her mind. Everything is wonderful, and she is borderline delusional. Uh, yeah, she's very <laughs> high energy, very uh, happy all the time, very she's optimistic about everything. Um, but by the way, I think it should be noted, this is something we haven't made a point of doing in the past, but we sh- should, at least for the main characters. Um, Mabel is voiced by Kristen Shaw, for people that might find that, uh, you know, relevant. She's uh, notable. She's uh, does the voice in a voice voice. She's known for voices in Bob's Burgers. I just wanted to bring that up really quick because I think it's something we've neglected on. Voice actors and actresses are they make these shows come to life, and I think they deserve some mention at least. Agreed. Would either of you like to talk about Dipper for a moment? Uh, yeah, so Dipper is uh, Mabel's brother. He's kind of uh, like geeky, dorky, nerdy. Uh, he's really into like Dungeons and Dragons type stuff and mystery. You know, he's, you always see him like uh, he talks about re- late, being up at late at night and reading mystery novels. Like I think there was at one point they, re- they referenced like Lost Boys, uh, not directly but as a parody or something. He do- he does kind of he's kind of into that type of stuff. He's very serious at times. Uh, he's very uh, focused on solving the weird stuff going on in the town. He meshes well with uh, Mabel and uh, is kind of a opposite to balance her out. It's kind of nice. Those are definitely the two main characters you see a lot. You also see a lot of uh, Great Uncle Stan. And uh. he is a grumpy shyster of an old man. He yep. <laughs> loves what he does when he uh, convinces people to spend their money on useless junk. Ah, uh, it's, <laughs> uh, it's so time. great. Pretty much every bit where Uncle uh, Grunkle Stan is uh, conning someone out of money is great. Um, some of his stuff is the funniest in the show, in my opinion. I just love watching him uh, be very aggressive in his uh, money-making plans. He has a roguish charm, that's for sure. When I first saw him, he reminded me of Carl Fredrickson from Up. Um, <laughs> that's that's I, a I very it, good... Yeah, go I think ahead. it's the look of his face that really set it off. Very square. <laughs> yeah. And in the first few episodes, I found him a little creepy. I guess that's just the way his character came off it, but you start to realize why he's that way, because he's a shyster. Yeah. And, yeah, that's then the comedy starts to build up, and you just get to like him. Yeah, uh, Grunkle Stan's great. Uh, there's a lot of good side characters, too, that are in no way really considered main characters, at least not to me, but one of my my favorite character in this entire show was a side character, Wendy. Great we'll character. more in depth than the characters later, but, yeah, she's... Uh, she's a very cool character, uh, very likable. Yeah, and there's Seuss, the other employee at the uh, Mystery Shack. He's very uh, dumb. <laughs> he's not the smartest person around. Uh, he, he's kind of <laughs> like the semi. Uh, uh, it's not really. He's like Mexican or some kind of Hispanic. We don't know. He's definitely Hispanic. Yeah. Yeah. Seuss uh, is sure for Jesus. Yeah. I guess, yeah, I didn't really think all that much about it, but yeah, he is... Oh, uh, really? He's your favorite character and you didn't realize his No, Wendy's Seuss. my favorite character. I like Seuss, okay. but Wendy's my favorite character. <laughs> no, I didn't really think all that much about exactly, like, oh, is he from Mexico or some other place down there? He is yeah. apparently native, because he doesn't seem to have any accent, but uh, his grandmother seems to be... Uh, She's got a Spanish accent, a Mexican yeah. accent. His grandmother is basically the, the housekeeper gag from Family Guy. Yeah, she's great. She <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, he's he is Latino, or at least half Latino. We're not sure. They don't really go much into ethnicity in this show, but yeah, it's not really. Yeah, he is what he is, and he's great. He's a bit dopey. It's imagine Chris Griffin's best moments, and you kind of have a bit of Seuss. That's a good comparison. I would have thought of that. Uh, I'm glad you said that. Uh, I guess I would say that I 
in my opinion, season two steps up the quality of most of it. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, Everything's like is cranked up to eleven in season two. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's well worth watching for season one. But uh, when I was watching it, my thoughts were, "Oh my god, this is amazing! Why does season one even exist?" For me, the surprises are sort of a, a highlight. But a lot of the time, I found them to be given away by some of the clues, especially the episode Monster of the Week sort of uh, clues. I feel like they were very on the nose. Do you guys agree with that? Or do you feel like uh, the yeah, it's, mysteries... Yeah. A lot of the mysteries uh, were shown quite a bit ahead of time. But I think that's part of the fun, though, because uh, I won't knock it too hard for that. I definitely agree that some stuff was too easy to see. But at the same time, it's meant to be digestible by kids if it was too obscure or too... Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to downplay or uh, not give kids enough credit because obviously they the show did really well and kids enjoyed it. But like, maybe that's part of the reason some of the, the secrets weren't as well hidden. That is about all I have to say that I could say in spoiler free. I'm tiptoeing yeah. near spoiler territory, saying much more. Do you guys have anything else to add? No, not really. Um, yeah, like like you said, it's very hard to talk about the show without spoiling. There's a lot of uh, things that we could say that would just not ruin the show. It'd still be worth watching, but like might ruin some of the mystery. Yeah, unfortunately, the mystery is such an intrinsic part of it. Whether or not you end up enjoying it, it would be a shame for us to spoil any of it in a spoiler-free segment. Warning, the spoiler-free section is now over. Continue listening at your own risk. So yeah, I guess uh, from there, we we can go talk about uh, what you guys expected, right? Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, had, we recorded your guys' thoughts beforehand. Uh, I guess we'll flash back to that now. So, uh, I've already watched Gravity Falls. I, uh, we're... I'm going to ask you guys, what do you guys expect from the show? So, what do you expect? I've seen two episodes completely disconnected from anything else. I didn't realize it was serialized at all when I watched this, so I guess from that I can expect it to be uh, not necessarily the most connected from start to finish from each episode. Uh, okay. I guess what I expect is, from what I've heard, it's got a mystery element to it. I suppose it reminds me of that old show, Eerie Pennsylvania, to a degree, but animated. Uh, I've seen the humor. The humor is pretty good. Um, I'm not blown away by it, but I am vaguely familiar with the main three characters. Um, I, I know it's got quite a following, so I expect the mystery element to really pick up and become something greater than the sum of its parts later on. Otherwise, why would people be clamoring for another season that the creator has said no to? Um, trying to think, what else would I say I expect of this? Um, I don't know if all the humor is really going to stick with me, but I don't think it's going to be disagreeable. I just really hope that there's a greater concept to it than just the two levels. I hope there's something else. It's very difficult to pin down exactly what you think of a show. I expect side characters to not be what they appear because if they are going to be side characters throughout the whole thing and it's going to be this mystery, why are they not part of the main cast? Uh, I'm looking forward to the mystery aspect of it more than the humor because cartoon humor can be terrific, but watching an entire series back to back, there's probably going to be more misses than hits. Well, I'll have to see what you think about it after the fact. How about you, Airhammer? I have absolutely no idea what to expect from this. Uh, I've maybe seen a clip at most, which I don't remember. The character designs look similar to other shows. I think there are some people that have worked for Steven Universe that have connections to this, which are probably a good thing. And I would have to wonder if the title of the show has anything to actually do with the plot. Uh, which it probably doesn't, but uh, based on the title, if I don't see a waterfall running in reverse at some point, I'll be disappointed. It's immediately spoiled <laughs> in the show, so it's not a big deal. It's the name of the place it take, where, it, where it takes place. Ah. <laughs> so, yeah. 
you have any expectations on the plot or the what the show itself will be about? Not exactly. Like maybe they go camping uh, often enough, or they're in a treehouse or something. I really have no idea. Okay, I, I, okay, you're gonna be very surprised by oh. the show. Is all I'm gonna oh, say. I have okay. one. I have one. Oh, yeah. uh, I think the mystery element. I think saying it's aliens is gonna be too on the nose. Two X Files. There might be some illusions, like okay, these guys seem to be aliens for a while. If it's only aliens, if it's exclusively about aliens and the conspiracy or the mystery, I'm going to be disappointed. It's I want not it to be aliens. something. Yeah, I want it to be something more like ancient civilization, something like almost like national treasure. Speaking of national uh, you'll, treasure, you'll see. You'll see. Cage. Does Nicholas I'm... Cage do a guest in this? <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. But it's. Oh. I'm really. I want to see what you guys think about it now. So yeah, I guess we're gonna pop yeah. back into the future from this point on. Uh, if I recall, my only expe- expectation was to see a waterfall going in reverse, and I got my wish at the end, but I wasn't expecting it in such a demonic manner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what did you think, uh, Deus? You know, it felt a little short of my expectations in the Monster of the Day, but the big story really came and brought it home. I feel like the shorts between season one and season two are exactly what I expected the show to be, but in like short three to five minute segments. Yeah. Those that's... shorts between are exactly what I expected this to be. I expected it to be that, but longer. Yeah. They're so kind of like little throwaway close. gags. Close. Yeah, I was really close, but yeah. they chose not to make that part of the actual episodes. Uh, I was not expecting uh, some of the really evil stuff. Bill Cipher, I had seen his image before I knew his name. I knew he existed. I was expecting him to be kind of a funny, silly villain. He is very evil and oh yeah, not quite as silly as I expected. He's kind <laughs> of a like chaotic evil or whatever. He's just like evil for the sake of being evil. He has no real... I mean, he does have an agenda, but, like, he does weird, crazy shit for the sake of it. He is an agent of chaos. I have a lot to say about him later on, but I consider him practically Cthulhu. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's (laughs) very good. Very good uh, comparison. I think think we even saw Cthulhu at one point. (laughs) Yeah, he he made a cameo. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Probably just... He probably hangs with him on the the weekends. Um... I didn't know any of the characters very well. I had seen them. I have to say that I liked the characters more than I was expecting. So, yeah. good on them for that. Yeah, I, same. I feel like I was a little bored with some of the episodes, especially the season one episodes. But when it came down to it, the end and everything that came together, the big story was very enjoyable. Yeah. So I, that was. Yeah, and I really didn't have much expe- As I said in the recording, I guess I didn't really have that much expectations for this show. Um, I kind of watched it without knowing anything about it, so I didn't really have anything going on. But yeah, it definitely uh, was worth watching. I'm glad I did. So uh, I guess this would fit in expectations. I'd heard a lot about the mystery elements, and. I was surprised at how they were put in. We mentioned earlier that the the some of the plot of the day stuff was given away a bit. And then there's the very deep background mystery that runs throughout every episode. I was really surprised there was no middle ground to the mystery. Yeah, there's no very there's either uh monster of the day or big the, the big plot. But there's no there's no like, eh, that's kind of somewhat important, but not, you know. Yeah, the, you either have to break out ciphers and codes and write things down and get screen caps and play sounds backwards, or you're like, oh hey, th- there's a gnome in the book. There's gonna be gnomes later. 
there's no middle ground. <laughs> there's yeah. no middle ground. Yeah, there's no. Oh, hey, I spotted that two episodes ago. It's finally coming up. Yay, I saw something. No, there are a is... little bit of things like that. Like, uh, I guess no, that doesn't really count. I was gonna Not point really. to the time travel episode, but yeah, you you can't really get any of that without context, so it doesn't really count. Yeah. It's sort of reverse continuity in that case. So I guess my expectations of the mystery were off because yeah. I knew there were some crack the code stuff. I knew there were hidden messages. I didn't know that it was all or none. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't really have much in the way of expectations, but the show blew my mind. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, an experience, and I'm glad I experienced it. Yeah, I guess we're moving on. Um, so, let's see. I, I, yeah, we're going on about the theme. To reiterate then for those uh, that don't remember from the spoiler-free or that need something a little more built up. So we have the whole thing with, uh, yeah, 12-year-old, 12-year-old Dipper Pines and his twin sister Mabel have been sent off to stay with their great-uncle Stan at uh, Gravity Falls, which is in Roadkill County, Oregon. And he runs the Mystery Shack, which is just this uh, one of many tourist traps around the town where he tries to sell off a bunch of useless junk for obscene prices. <laughs> $200 snow globes. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's very... Uh, I guess since we don't really... This this section... Uh, or we don't have a complete section for this on this episode, I want to kind of shoot tail it in here, kind of setting kind of fits with theme mm-hmm. and plot in my mind. It's set in Oregon, and yeah. for those that don't know, I live in Oregon. It's very kind of authentic feeling, small town, uh, especially for me, because I live in a small town. I live on the coast more rather than in central Oregon, but it's, it's it seems very much like places I've been. For example, two towns over, there is a place where I can go to see a, a wax museum. Hmm. Like, there are... Uh, Curiosity uh, type novelty shops all over the place. It's and, and it's also a thing in uh, you know Northern California as well. Very touristy thing, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to get that in there. It feels very much like a, a small Oregon town. Even small stuff uh, like the background, uh, the backgrounds are there's trees everywhere, right? And that's very much a, you know it's a forest here. <laughs> it feels very authentic. So yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, sneak that yeah, in really great. quick. In fact, that leads me into one of the themes I have that I know. There's a theme, this underlying idea of Americana behind the show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a it's lot always... of interesting themes in the show. One of the ones that I would point out is uh, about like kind of growing up. Like, yes, I think um, one of the accepting. I yeah, this. it's accepting ch- things change. And sometimes you're just, it sucks, but you're going to have to deal with that. Yeah. What I wrote down here in my notes is uh, moving on and the passage of time. Yeah. Mm. It's uh, another thing, a major thing I would point out in the show is uh, it has a lot to do with siblings, sibling relationships. Other shows, like uh, like when we talked about Sailor Moon, even though it wasn't real romance, it was kind of more just teenage lust, but they were trying to go for romance as a theme, right? The show, instead of having those types of relationships, is about, like, sibling relationships. There's Dipper and Mabel, obviously. There's Stan and, spoiler alert, uh, Stanford. Uh, Wendy very much plays a older sibling-type role to Dipper and Mabel at times. Same with Seuss. It, everything feels uh, very, like, it's trying to convey kind of importance to close family relationships. Or at least I felt that way. Yeah. I don't actually have any siblings, so I don't have any first-hand experience with that. I definitely saw uh, the reoccurrence of siblings, uh, especially between two sets of Pines twins. Yeah, they're, that one's flat-out obvious. Yeah, like, I I have a younger sister, and I wish my relationship with, with her was like Dippers to Mabel. <laughs> like, they have a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm the complete opposite. I, I, of course, I have a a bit different age gaps between me and my siblings, but, uh, I wouldn't say it's exactly the same, but I, ha- I have, 
this made me feel fondly of my relationship with my siblings. So yeah, there's that. There's definitely that's definitely a recurring theme and of the entire show, in my opinion, anyway. And definitely, uh, it's there, whether or not it was intentional, and I would probably think it is. But another one that might not be intentional, and I want your guys' opinion on this: breaking rules, because there's a lot of criminal activity, like a lot, a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, they break a lot of rules. Um, a lot of laws, too. Yeah. I mean, they break into pools at night for the fun of it. <laughs> uh, Stan pickpockets a couple things. He shoplifts once. Uh, he is... It's he mostly not Stan. tell the kids. To, it's mostly Stan, but he does not <laughs> stop Mabel. If she wants to break a rule or a law, he actually encourages her. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So, He's not... Yeah, uh... What do you make of that? Because... I feel like there's almost this rebellious side to it. Uh, it feels too on top of things to not be intentional. I'm just not sure where it, where to put it as far as what it's supposed to present to us. I think it's just there. Uh, in my opinion, I it's definitely there. They're breaking laws all the time. It might just be a comedic comedic thing. You know, hammer home the point that they're all kind of twisted in their morality. Maybe. Maybe it's supposed to be a commentary on morality and stuff. I don't know. I feel like it's so prevalent in the show, and the show is written so well that it's hard to say that it doesn't represent something. But for the life of me, I couldn't quite figure out what it was supposed to mean. So maybe it's just that everybody's morals are subjective. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely... Uh... <laughs> It's def- worth noting. I don't know really how it fits into like a, a theme, it's, but it's definitely a reoccurring thing. So, one of the things that I noticed was the humor. Uh, it's obviously a comedy show, but I like how the humor is used to build up the characters and used to build up the story sometimes, too. Oh, yeah, Primarily, right. comedies are going to use jokes that way, but the way they did it was really well done because the characters don't get a ton of growth, but they do get a lot of characterization, and the humor is a very strong component of that. You want to give us an example of what you're talking about? Ah, oh, man, you're putting me on the spot. Give me a moment to brainstorm. Uh, okay. Yeah, actually, now that I think about it, Seuss. Uh, the episode Seuss and the Real Girl, he is sitting there riding one of those little, like, choo-choo trains where you put the quarters in meant for three-year-olds. <laughs> and he is just going to town. He's at least 20. Yeah. <laughs> He's like a 200-pound man just riding that train to make himself cheer up. He is straight-up Deadpool in it. Yeah. No shame. Yeah, and he it is a great a example woman. of his character, too. He's yeah. very much he a kid at picking heart. up a woman while riding a uh, kitty's choo-choo train. She not only gives him her number, but 50 cents to ride again. Yeah, she... But yeah, that's yeah. a good example of the humor building up the story and the characters. It's, yeah, it's a good thought. <sighs> But yeah, the plot is very, uh, yeah, they, um, it's set in this town, they're, you're visiting their uncle, they, uh, there's a bunch of mysteries going on, Dipper finds this journal, and he is obsessed with finding the author of it, because the journal has all this information on the weird shit going on in the town. The plot is very hidden behind the walls a lot of the time, but eventually comes out, um, there's this whole overarching conspiracy with, like, what the hell stands hiding. It's eventually revealed that it's a portal to find his twin brother that was sucked away. It's very, uh... And then it gets even crazier with, like, this demonic thing, Triangle, named Bill Cipher, that starts, like, summoning... Or gets into the world and starts, like, just causing pure chaos. And when I say pure chaos, I mean, like, think LSD trip. Like, there's a fucking... Uh, it's weird. It's weird. <laughs> any yeah. Of you, uh, any My Little Pony fans can think of the character Discord, but more malicious. <laughs> yeah, and like he's his minions are just pure weird. Like, there's one point where someone pisses him off, and he's just like, "I'm gonna switch all the holes on your face," and his nose is like on his ear, and his eyeballs are like where his mouth is supposed to be, and he just leaves him like that for a good chunk of time out of nowhere, just just because he pissed him off. He's very like chaotic. Yeah, that was satisfying and disturbing at the same time, just because of who it was. <laughs> yeah, some kids are gonna have nightmares about that. One. <laughs> He's very, very, 
over the top. His minions yeah. are also crazy. Like he summons like this weird, like he's just like a keyhole or something, right? Isn't that one? His minions, I would describe them as the doodles in a white zombie album cover. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically that. Like just a pair of teeth, a keyhole, a monster with eight balls for eyes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's all zombie kind. doodles. Yeah, they're all it's fucking weird over the top stuff. Yeah, Bill is literally Illuminati confirmed, just with limbs and a top hat. So <laughs> this kind of leads into characters, is. which is a nice transition. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I would yeah. like to speak more on some of the the parts of the theme because I feel like it just wouldn't fit anywhere else later. Sure. Uh-huh. Uh, so one of the problems I have with the show is it's got hit and miss memory of some of the previous story of the day plot lines and I, I've got two ideas on that that I'm not happy with either one is stuff like the little bandages on Stan's hand are remembered and the t-shirts are remembered yeah like, uh, Toby's t-shirt whereas things like the copy machine that copies people are completely forgotten where that could have yeah. been an amazing tool at several times <laughs> It was so frustrating for them to bring up little details and leave things that are very big and significant. Leave it behind. Don't think about it. It's gone. Yeah, it's kind of unfortunate. And... That's definitely something that uh, I noticed as well. Like, hey, how easy would this situation be if we just had a hundred more copies of ourselves running around? Or, you know, hey, maybe we could trick Bill Cipher by having a copy of Dipper. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe uh, it'll work. It's definitely or a missed opportunity. Why didn't Gideon find that in the shack and make copies of himself? <laughs> <laughs> right? There's so maybe many they destroyed it. Maybe they never showed them. I would them, have but, yeah. loved. I would have loved to see it blow up on screen. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Just it's tell me why it's not being a, used. It's definitely a uh, plot hole. Yeah, I that is frustrating because it's such a well done show. Otherwise, there are so many tightly packed things that it considers and for it to completely drop a few things like that was frustrating to see yeah. uh, another There's, thing other times though they do it really well like like you mentioned uh, after Stan hurts his hand you could see him wearing bandages through yeah. all the future episodes yeah it's selective memory that's frustrating to see also a uh, lot of characters reoccur mm-hmm. in the final episodes mm-hmm. All throughout, like yeah. the Manators. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another part of that, I guess the B side of that argument is some of the, I don't want to call them filler, but some of the typical episodes where there's a problem and a solution in one episode that doesn't really pertain to the main plot, I feel like they're padded out and may have been better suited to the short format that you see in a lot of modern shows, the 11 minute episodes. Do you guys agree with that? Do you think that some yeah, of the episodes a... should have been short format, some of them should have been long format? I would all yes. like to see it mixed up. There's definitely... <sighs> some of the plots could have been condensed and released as shorts online. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know how I feel about them like being still trying to fit into the actual season. As like, hey, here's episode two, and it's only a half episode, while some other episodes are full-length episodes. I would f- feel that that would lead people to feeling very like ripped off when, uh, you know, you're waiting for the new episode to come out and it's only a half one. Uh, yeah, like, I, th- I think we really enjoyed the first episode and then two through five seemed a little lackluster or something, so almost like they could have been a tad shorter. Yeah, uh, there's stuff. definitely yeah. a lot of plots that could have been skipped over or mm-hmm. shortened. I will agree with that 100%. I'm glad I'm not alone in that. Uh, another question I have for you guys. There's a lot of, like, 80s and 90s references that I'm sure adults get, but are they over the heads of kids? Are they too dated for kids to understand? Is I think... New chess tapes and... I think that it might not even be meant for kids to understand. It might just be for a lot of shows throw shit in like that for the parent that happens to be sitting on the couch with their kid while it's on. Maybe, but this seems like there's a lot of them. I don't know. I think it just might be a uh, what-the-author-knows type thing. Maybe. Who knows? It's definitely uh, worth noting, and I don't know what. Right, what do you... Before I get on, before I get on to my last uh, 
my last major complaint, I do have one thing that upset me that I need to mention. It's a nitpick by most people's standards, but I was really upset by this. Uh, there's a zombie episode. Very good episode. Uh, really <laughs> cranks up the horror. They end up defeating these zombies through the power of music. The music is not thriller. It's not even a parody <laughs> of thriller. <laughs> Fuck you, Gravity Falls. Where's my thriller? If I'm going to see zombies defeated by music, <laughs> it's going to be motherfucking thriller. Yeah, it but definitely it should have been a, a reference or parody to it. Because, like, there's no reason they couldn't have. They make flat-out parody references to tons of other shows. like Or tons of other uh, songs. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that upset me. I know. I was there. I watched it. Or I was with you... Yeah, at some point well, when I watched it, <laughs> I'm, I'm calm now. I'm better. <laughs> so yeah, you want to move guess, on to characters? Or no, we were, we're already on characters. There's uh, one more thing, and I don't know if it fits here or in characters, but it feels more like it fits here in theme. Uh, we're heading into heavy spoiler territory because it pertains to the very end of the show. Uh, at the end of the last episode they defeat Bill Cipher by wiping Stan's mind I really hate the cop out that he got his memories back and I, I hate to wish ill I, I hate to wish ill upon agree. a character I love but that was such a cop out and I feel like they missed a lot of opportunity with that it could have been done better yeah I don't necessarily like the fact that he didn't permanently lose his memories or whatever you know I don't necessarily want him to be permanently clueless to who he really is, but I think that, A, that might have been a stronger ending, and it just doesn't make sense. Like, if he remembers himself, how does that not defeat the purpose of wiping the memory of him in the first place? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it, since he's starting to remember, a, what's not to say that Bill's going to come back again? Hammer, what's your take on this? Well, yeah, like I was just going to say, what if this were to build into a future plot point where somehow Bill survived the whole thing since Stan's memory came back? Yeah. It could definitely play into a movie if they decided to do it. Um, That's true. It's like somehow Bill was just hiding away at that very last second, and with Stan getting his memory back, Bill is just sitting there in wait. For all yeah. you know, he could be controlling Stan half the time, and you wouldn't even know it. I like that headcanon now. That the 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 stand that's back isn't actually stand. It's Bill Cipher. That is an interesting idea. That's fun fan theory. Uh, but the way they ended it, it was so emotional. I oh, very much so. They took away. They took away the consequences of victory. Most yeah. of the impact of the finale was just completely fizzled away when he got it. They had this cool allegory for Alzheimer's there. They had this, we saved the day, but what have we lost? What was the cost of it? They they had so much going, and it lasted all of a minute and a half. I was let down by that. Yeah, it's very unfortunate, the missed opportunity. It's still good overall. So the last four episodes, Weird Mageddon, are fantastic oh, yeah. as a whole. The ending is a letdown, but holy crap. Like, remember when we mentioned that season two cranks up to 11? It's mostly these last stretch, man. It is just, everything is just... Balls to the wall is crazy. If those are 11, I think the rest of season 2 is 9, because I was really yeah. much happier with season 2. Uh, I do think the ending was very, very good, despite it, but that had to be said somewhere, either in characters or here in the yeah. plot. I felt like it fit more here in the plot. And it's definitely but a good I'm, transition into characters. Yeah, I'm ready to move mm. on. Are you guys ready to move on? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I guess uh, there's a lot to be said about characters in this show, because... Like I said, it's very... It puts a lot of emphasis on sibling relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And as a person, I have three siblings I have, you know, pretty good relationships with as a whole. That's really interesting to me. I like I liked those uh, relationships in this show. Especially, like, the kind of adoptive relationship that Wendy has as an older sibling to uh, uh, Dipper and Mabel. Yeah, Wendy kind of starts out more of a lazy character in the first few episodes, and they really build up on her re really well. Yeah, she definitely has some of the most uh, deep stories. She actually, her and Seuss, rightfully so, because they get the most screen time, definitely have the most uh, backstory for any side character, which is nice. They definitely deserve it. They're both wonderfully uh, uh, 
voice acted. The voice talent is really good. But yeah, uh, I really enjoy all the side characters in this show. I enjoy their relationships with each other. There's a lot of um, kind of oh, great yeah. family esque moments. It's really nice. I like. I really like, for example, the scene where uh, Dipper finally admits that he likes Wendy, right? <laughs> And she's mm-hmm. like, yeah, I always kind of knew. There's like They weren't even going to like try to claim that she uh, didn't know what was going on. You know, She's just like, duh, obviously. And I like how their, their relationship grows as a part of that. What do you guys think about the, the way the sibling relationships are shown in this show? Well, uh, yeah, just reiterating on what I said before, I, I really love the relationship between Dipper and Mabel. It's that, like, I guess it's just because it's the whole, uh, the twin relationship in that they've done so much together growing up and they have that, that click between them. And I really wish that I had that kind of a relationship with my sister in a way, because in all honesty, I can't stand her. But <laughs> this is the type of relationship you want to have with your sibling, uh, male or female. Always there for each other. Like, they're very protective oh, yes. of each other and stuff like that. Yes, exactly. And mine is nothing like that. <laughs> yeah. There's times where they, they sacrifice stuff that's very important to themselves. Something mm-hmm. that's very, very meaningful to them. They sacrifice it for the well-being or happiness of their sibling. And it's, it's, it's great. It's done really well. Yeah, and like even when we see uh, the flashbacks, we have uh, Stanley and Stanford. Great names there, by the way, parents. Um, they're also twins, and they had that same kind of click, but then... Uh, we see that as they get older, Stanley became more of the slack and the the joke, whereas Stanford became the academic. And we're looking at Dipper and Mabel now at 12, going on 13 in the show, and we don't know what their lives are going to be like as they're getting toward the end of high school, if that will ever be shown in any way, shape, yeah, or form. It's very much uh, like supposed to parallel. It, it's obviously that Dipper and uh, Mabel's uh, relationship is supposed to parallel uh, Stanley and Stanford's. And it's done really well. And that uh, it kind of shows that maybe their relationship will end up better. And there's already signs that it will because, you know, Dipper really yeah. wanted to stay in Gravity Falls and learn about the mysteries there with his uncle instead of returning with his sister. And when he realized how upset that made her, he decided to go back instead. It's a nice parallel between the two relationships. They're definitely supposed to play on each other and marry each other, but like, kind of like an alternate scenario. Like, here's what might have gone differently if Stanford hadn't took an off and left Stanley behind. Hmm. It's very uh, well done. I like it. To be honest, the relationships didn't jump out at me, and I'm wondering now if that is perspective of you two actually having siblings and me not because uh, yeah. to me the relationships were not at the forefront I recognized what Dipper and Mabel had but I saw it more as a plot convenience or simply part of their characters rather than something that was at the forefront I don't know it definitely might be just something different for each person it, and that's a, a good reason why we have so many you know three, we have three hosts on this show and that we're going to get a lot of different perspectives on stuff because it, the sibling relationships definitely popped out to me. There were very heavy emphasis on them. I feel, uh, from what Airhammer said, he sees that as well. And it's interesting that uh, you didn't see them. It's not a, really a statement on you at all. It's just interesting. And it makes the show a little bit interesting, in my opinion. It might mean different things to different people. And that's hmm. uh, neat. It may require some personal experience to see those. I'm not sure. But yeah, I wanted to uh, talk a bit more about the uh, the voice cast while we're on characters. It has some really good voices. Uh, Dipper and Mabel are excellent choices for their uh, characters. Uh, actually, ev- pretty much everyone is. I guess one of the only voices that I really kind of got tired of, and uh, because he's just done, he's hammered home so much, and he becomes so important later. I really got tired of Old Man McGucket, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, um, I feel like. His uh, campiness wore off its charm by like the third or fourth time you'd seen him. But that, maybe that's just me. I was saving for this for the music and sound direction segment, but I'll go ahead and use it now because it is pertinent to the characters. Yeah, the the voice cast is very good, and the guest voices are out of this world good. Oh um, yeah, definitely. John Oliver, uh, Larry King, Coolio. Neil deGrasse Tyson, Mark Hamill, Lance Bass, just to name a few. 
Yeah, Holy it is crap, do they nuts. have really good and, and really well-placed voices. These aren't just, hey, we'll pick somebody random to voice this character. It is very well done. Yeah, Neil like, for example, Tyson Larry King comes on and voices himself as a wax figure. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson voices a super intelligent talking pig. Uh, <laughs> John Stewart shows up on the show at one point. I think he's the uh, the Judge yeah. Cat. I can't remember what episode it was. Judge Kitty Kitty Meow Face something. It was very late. Yeah, uh, you know Check, what I'm talking about. Second to last episode. Yeah. Uh, Mark Hamill does an amazing job as a monster, the uh, shapeshifter. Ah, oh, it's mm. so good. Yeah, the voices are def I'm, are definitely something that are a highlight of this show. Um. With that said, I, there's one thing that really disappointed me, and a lot of the main voice cast got reused a bit too much. Uh, I'm looking specifically at Kevin Michael Richardson. He's an amazing voice oh, yeah, actor. Blubs. Nothing against him. But every time they needed a guy with a deep voice, every time they needed a black guy, every time they just wanted a deep voice, like, hey, there's a talking tree with a deep voice. Kevin, get on it. Yeah, <laughs> don't, it's don't definitely... That much. He's, they... he's too recognizable. Yeah, it's hard to mask his voice. There's certain people that can get away with voicing multiple characters on the same show, like, say, Seth MacFarlane, for example, because yeah. uh, he has such a high range. But Kevin Michael Richardson is not one of them. He's, yeah, he's every voice amazing. is the same. It's a good voice. It's it's Oh, man, it's perfect for Sheriff Blubbs and what Sheriff Blubbs' character is. But I was, No, I was super thrilled. He could have got away with three, but not a dozen. Yeah, it's overdone, definitely. But yeah, I uh, Jason Ritter does Dipper. It's and uh, Alex, or the creator of the show, Alex uh, Hirsch or Hirsch. I don't Hirsch. know how to pronounce it. Hirsch. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, he uh, does the voice of Grunkle Stan. He also plays Seuss. Uh, yep. And Bill yep. Cipher. Ah. He does uh, three really great characters. He's a guy with enough range to cover multiple voices without yeah overlapping. He's definitely on the. Uh, Seth MacFarlane into that spectrum I mentioned before. Hmm. If you guys don't mind me shifting gears, I have a question for you. Sure. Is this a character-driven gri- show? Uh, some ways, there's a lot of uh, like I, like Airhammer and I said, there's a lot, in, at least to me, and I think to him as well. I don't want to speak for you, Airhammer, but uh, I don't think it would be a good of a show to me if. Uh, it didn't have the themes and the relationships that they have between the characters. Um, that's a yeah. really important part of it to me. So, yeah, I would say it's partly character-driven. It it's definitely has a lot more emphasis on the mysteries and plots going on. But uh, for me, yeah, there's the characters are a very important part of the show. I'm on the mm-hmm. same page. Uh, I feel like it, it's not the majority, but it's probably the strongest of a plurality of forces. There's a lot of things driving the show, and characters are probably that 40% where everything else is sharing the 60. It's not really driven primarily by the characters, but they're a strong asset. And the characters are the reason the plot is uh, being pushed forward, uh, because, mm-hmm. you know, shit's just not happening to them. I mean, it is, but a lot of the stuff that happens is actively because of the choices the characters make. Dipper's actively searching out clues for the weirdness going on in the town. Dipper's actively looking for info on various things, right? A lot of the stuff would not have happened without them, is I guess what I'm saying. And that makes them important. Yeah, they're they're not passive in the storytelling. But yeah. I guess we should move into our intro. We usually do this much earlier, but we're gonna... Mm, well, there's a lot of characters, there's even ones we haven't we talked about. Talk, we uh, should yeah. talk more okay. about the characters. Okay. There's um, a lot of yeah, like, oh, well, okay, we have our first antagonist, obviously. We have a little Gideon, oh, who yeah. is basically Dudley Dursley, but younger and a bit more of a little prick. <laughs> um, he has this uh, southern accent thing going on. Yeah, he plays himself up as this uh, psychic, is it? Yeah, at the start. Yeah. He's a scam artist and, like Grunkle Stan. Yeah. But yeah, Gideon, uh, he winds up discovering uh, book number two. And yeah, we haven't really discussed uh, the book very, uh, the journals very much. Um, yeah, Dipper finds uh, journal number three in the first episode. Uh, they're pretty big, red. They have this uh, gold outline of a six-fingered hand, 
on the cover with a, a number written on them. And uh, yeah, Gideon has journal number two, and for the most part, he thinks throughout most of the what is it first season that there's only two of these things. But eventually, he discovers that Dipper has journal three, so he's on the lookout for the first. Yeah, well, he, and, when he realizes um, that Dipper has a journal, he uh, just automatically assumes it's journal one. It's number that's, one, yeah. That's the only ones that he has at least some reason for <laughs> believing exist. Oh, if there's a journal two, obviously there probably is a journal one. Okay, he had no reason to believe in, that journal three was around. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't really ready to talk about this, but I guess since you brought him up, Gideon is fucking amazing. <laughs> Gideon is my probably second favorite character in the entire show. Who's I your favorite? love uh, my favorite is Mabel. She is my favorite oh, Disney yeah. princess. I should have seen that coming. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mabel anyway. Pines is my favorite Disney princess. Uh moving Leia down to second. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh what are your Gideon, thoughts on Gideon? Gideon is amazing. He is the perfect foil to the Pines family. He is in my opinion, the best villain of the show. He is very entertaining. He's a wicked little rat of a kid. Selfish, greedy. He is like the evil reflection of everything the Pines family has going on. Uh, just like Mabel, he is in love with this idea of romance, and he doesn't really care who. Just the same way as she does. She falls in love with yeah. the first boy she sees every week. And he fell for her because they have this shared idea of romance is terrific. And he goes all creepy stalkery guy after she friend zones him, but uh, no, her intuition t- turned out true because he's a creepo, but he's got that going on. He's also intuitive and uh, skeptical the same way Dipper is. He's got a journal. So they have that duality going on. Whereas Dipper uses it to solve problems, Gideon uses it to leverage things for his own personal gain. He completely abuses the power of the journal and all the mystic knowledge within it, all the secrets. Likewise, he is a shyster the same way Stan is, but instead of luring in people and using their own stupidity against them, Gideon sets people up, uses their emotions against them, uh, tricks them the way any of those uh, fake psychic assholes do. (laughs) So Gideon is like the evil version of all three of the Pines family put together. He is freaking amazing as a villain. He is entertaining every time he's on screen. Uh, There's this certain energy when he's talking, when he's there. And yeah, I love Gideon. He's a trip. Uh, yeah, Gideon, I, I will 100% agree that uh, Gideon is a great character. I will not say he, I cannot agree that he's the best villain, because I just think that the fact that, uh, in my opinion, you could remove Gideon from the plot of the story, and it would be relatively okay still. And if if you removed Bill from the story, it wouldn't be the same. And Are I think going that... To do this now? Are we already on this debate? I, I wanted to talk about some of the other characters before we got into this big debate, but but yeah, I I'm not even all that interested in debating it because I think it's mostly an opinion thing. But uh, I definitely uh, enjoy Bill Cipher more as a villain, so I just wanted to put that out there. All right, uh, well, uh, get some words um, in because I'm going to I'm going to speak. <laughs> well, okay, I, if Mabel and Gideon are your top two, what's your third? Because I was actually considering doing a top three here. <sighs> Stanford. Stanford? Okay. Uh, I might talk to you. Wendy, obviously, number one. Seuss. Then maybe... I don't know. Number three is hard. Uh, Maybe uh, Stanley? Uncle Uncle Stan? What about you? My three would be Mabel, Wendy, and my avatar, Waddles. (laughs) Waddles is pretty great. (laughs) I love Waddles. Yeah, for those... (laughs) For those that don't know, I do have a bit of a thing for pigs when it comes to the internet. This all started 14 years ago on uh, the Bot Talk message board, where I got my nickname of Hammy, and I started using an avatar of uh, Ham from Toy Story, and it just ballooned from there. So wherever I am on the internet, you're likely to see a pig in some form. And right now I'm using Waddles. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. 
Waddles is pretty great. In fact, this the show has a lot of great characters. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you what. Why don't I give you guys a rundown of what I think of the characters? Well, sure. Well, let's hear what your uh, arguments for... Uh, you were going to go on a spiel about Gideon. Uh, I, you, well, I already went on my spiel about uh, Gideon. Gideon's terrific. My spiel <laughs> was about how I don't like Bill Cipher. Okay, oh. yeah. It's a, it's a character. He's a character. Why not fit here? He's a character. He's a character. Uh, so I guess if you guys want to hear it, I'll break right into it. Yeah, I, I think I'm interested. Every character in the show is characterized very well, Bill Cipher included. I know who Bill Cipher is. I could drop Bill Cipher into any other show, and I have a good idea of how he would react. That is probably the strongest thing I could say about him. He's a plot point more than he is a character, though. And yeah. that's unfortunate because he's fun when he's on screen. He yeah, is so evil. He is not really relatable in any way. He's, there's no sympathetic aspect of him. Yeah, I, I think that's part of the interest I have in him in that he is not like a lot of villains you see. He's just chaotic evil for the sake of being evil. He's not... You don't have to really worry about... I mean, it might make him a little bit less... Um, uh, you know, like, you can't really sympathize with him, but, like, he is just weirdly chaotic for being... the sake of being weirdly chaotic. He's... That's... I, it's, I get that. I can't and really put it as I, a strong suit or a weak point. It's just a point. I think well, it works no, it's well. Not it required. makes him interesting. No, you're right. It's not required to be a good villain for them to be sympathetic. Uh, I actually rewatched a few episodes and re-examined things to see, okay, well, maybe he's not a personality, but maybe more of a force of nature. Sort of like the Joker. The Joker is a force of nature that's very chaotic and does things just for the sake of chaos. But I feel like he fell short, at least on my opinion, uh, because he doesn't really cause any of the heroes to have any kind of self-reflection other than Ford, which is way in the past before the show began. He doesn't really challenge the heroes to think about their way of thinking about the world, their perspective at all. Uh, he has no ideology. He doesn't really have a concept that he presents to the viewers. The only challenge he poses is uh, minimal. In fact, he's beaten by children twice. Once by a Nerf gun, and the second time by tickling. <laughs> he yeah, I don't... doesn't really cause the heroes to do anything to... They don't stretch themselves to beat him. He's not difficult to overcome. Uh, he doesn't make them challenge themselves that. or grow. I disagree with the, like I'm I, I definitely think there's a missed opportunity. It should have been more drastic, but they definitely had to do... had challenges in... Uh, Overcoming them, they had, they wiped Stan's memory for you know. They didn't do that. Stan made that decision on his own. Okay, well, they okay. the characters away. did though. Dipper and yeah. Mabel didn't, but yeah, that Stan, Stan and or Stanley and Stanford Stan Stan. are definitely yeah. still characters that interact with them. Yeah, I can agree. Yeah. He is not as a uh, fleshed out character as Gideon. I just think, for me, and this is always going to be a thing that's a matter of taste. Like a lot of things we talk about, I think he is. Just part of the fact that he's a more important and more unique character puts him up there as a better villain, for me. But, uh, he's definitely central to the main plot of the show. I won't deny that. He's also, like I said, fun on the screen, but he's got this ability to... He's got this temptation ability, right? To show the characters, especially Dipper and Ford, their dark sides. And pretty much both times he failed instantly. Uh, he he doesn't really stretch the characters to do things. He doesn't make them challenge their ethics, their emotions, the way their perspective. Nothing changes. The only person that challenges themselves to overcome it is Mabel in Weird Mageddon to overcome her Mabel land. That mm -hmm. is the only time that he actually presents a true force I don't of know. nature. I that, think uh, uh, there's the whole scenario where he gets... Uh, where he gets them trapped in Stan's mind and Dipper's stressing over whether or not uh, Stan likes him. That's true, but that's not him. That's all Dipper. Bill doesn't actually the, the, do that. That's the situation Dipper's comes along because of uh, Bill. The situation comes along because he can peer into Stan's memories and misinterpret something 
he's still feeling that way even if he wasn't in Stan's mind. Fair enough. He would have been feeling that even if there was a Cyclops around turning people to stone instead of the Cypher there. But yeah, I see what you're saying. I just, I will stand by my uh, my thought in that this is just a matter of opinion, really. It is, but I feel like when I'm challenging that the main villain of the plot of this show is bad, like really bad, I need to back up my opinion. Yeah. I can't and just I'm glad you did. I just saying. don't, I'm not sure I agree with how bad it is. But yeah, I agree with some of your points. What do you think, Airhammer? What do you think of Bill Cipher as a villain? Uh, yeah, very evil. <laughs> yeah. Just, the guy's nuts. Um, yeah, just a comparison with him to Gideon is that, yeah, Gideon is looking for power, wealth, and so forth, and Bill just wants to bring over his cohorts and cause absolute chaos and destruction. Like, just what we see from Weirman again is crazy enough. The guy's got a throne made out of stone bodies. Yeah. Yikes. Like, he's got literal Cthulhu as one of his own minions. Like, that's how evil he is. <laughs> Maybe that's why I don't like him, because it, he is very much like Cthulhu, but he's got a voice. You don't mm. give Cthulhu a voice. You make Cthulhu terrifying. You make him unfathomable. And maybe this front that Bill Cipher puts on to talk to Gideon and Stanford and uh, Dipper, maybe that is just thrown away at the end and he's some incomprehensible beast. And that could have possibly been better. I don't know. I do know that he's based on the Illuminati and the Dollar Bill, and there's yeah, no the, references to the either triangle in the bill. show. The tri- uh, well, his name is partly a uh, reference to it. the Bill, the fact that his name yeah. is Bill, but yeah. It's based on uh, the, the eye on the Dollar it. Bill. The that's about it, thing. yeah. There's no... Uh, yeah, it's, isn't that disappointing? A little bit, I know bit, it's yeah. stretching it. Uh, but, it's a little... They could have done something more with that. There is a little bit Illuminati-esque feelings with the whole, like, cover-up of the whatever-and-a-half president. Yeah, kind of has feelings that, that they don't reference it directly, though. I would have loved if they came back and said the reason that Bill is on the dollar bill is because he drove Trembly insane. Like, yeah, that would that'd be, be nice. Wouldn't that have been a great plot point? Yeah, that'd be, so that'd many missed cool. opportunities. This is what I'm talking about when I say I don't like Bill Cipher, because he has nothing but missed opportunities and letdowns for me. I want to love him, but I don't. I guess he does have a chance to be redeemed if they do make a movie or something and he makes a comeback. In fact, I'm going to say this now. I want Bill Cipher in the next Kingdom Hearts game. <laughs> oh, that'd he's be Disney. amazing. As a summon he's or something? Disney. Just No, as a boss. A villain. I want an oh, entire yeah. like world to uh, Bill Cipher <laughs> messing with you. Oh, yeah, kind of like an uh, extra super boss? A super boss or like just a world based on Bill Cipher screwing with you. Yeah, and I want to see uh, his minions. Like yeah. all the Heartless replaced with <laughs> Keyhole yeah. and 8-Ball. Yeah, Weird McGun level, please. <laughs> Square Enix, listen to this podcast and uh, make the Weird McGun level in the next Kingdom of Hearts game. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, and then we have Time Baby, which doesn't make any goddamn sense whatsoever, but, you know, there it is. <laughs> um, yeah, Time Baby's a... Uh... Bill appears to be aware of his existence, so... We have to wonder where does Time Baby come from, or how far does Bill's existence expand in the u- time and space as it as it is. Yeah, it's very. Uh, yeah, it's ver- not really well put out how much Bill knows and how much he doesn't know, because obviously he doesn't know some things. By other times, he's very much aware. Like uh, he, uh, from like really early, one of his first appearances, he references the main characters by their. Symbol, if you will, each like a lot, twelve different characters in the show have a symbol related, somehow <laughs> related to their personality, and they are supposed to be prophesized to stop Bill. He only ever refers to Seuss's question mark. Yeah, and the same. Oh, he calls uh, Mabel <laughs> shooting star, and he calls. Uh, yeah, Richard like. Yeah. yeah, I guess we could go on about little things like that. Like, uh, uh, obviously, we've been talking about Dipper a lot. Um, that's his nickname. Uh, we we never learn his actual first name in the show. Uh, he has a birthmark in the shape of a Dipper constellation on his forehead, hence the yep. name. Um, uh, we really haven't talked much about the monsters of the week. Um, like, 
we went on about how Mabel loves pretty much every boy she comes across and tries to get a boyfriend. Uh, speaking uh, of, that <laughs> merman, merman guy is basically Tuxedo Mask. <laughs> yes. I I kind of want to get a clip of that and just put the tux, Tuxedo Mask actual music to the back of it, but I didn't realize they don't really have to because it even has the maracas. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, Mabel can be really weird in that regard. Um, you know, in the first episode, she looks like she is trying to win the affections of a zombie and in the end it's you know not what we expect that wasn't blood that was jam uh, <laughs> oh that's great yeah the gnomes uh, yeah the, the gnomes, stacked really gnomes. Uh, yeah the, they start to frantically go through the journal what's their weakness what's their weakness we don't know they have none and then all of a sudden throughout the last portion of the episode you know what their weaknesses are shovels leaf blowers six pack <laughs> holders and and goats. <laughs> well, they're gnomes. They're not really that difficult to. Yeah, yeah I guess we could talk hilarious. about characters forever on this show. There's so they're many good little side with, characters. They're heads with beers and limbs. That's it. They don't seem to have a midsection yeah. whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> Would it be okay if we talked a bit about character growth? Because I thought that was uh, a weird part for their show. Because I feel like the tertiary side characters grow more than the main cast. Uh, it, it's one of those things where the main characters fit into their role and don't really change much. I guess, um, in a way, Dipper and Mabel exchange some momentum because Mabel fails to learn from her selfishness for most of the show, and Dipper slowly, slowly becomes more lovable. But most of the other characters don't really learn anything or grow or become better, except for weird background characters like McGrucket and uh, Toby. You know, uh, I think there's you know, definitely um, character growth okay. in the main characters. Seuss comes to terms with his uh, dad not being around. Wendy uh, goes through her relationship and then break up with uh, Robbie. Grunkle Stan is uh, kind of on a, somewhat on the mend with his relationship with his brother. After you know lots of issues there, Dipper and Mabel have to uh, come to terms with the fact that hey, sometimes I might have to sacrifice something I want to make other people happy. But both Dipper and Mabel have similar character growths, in my opinion. Um, they almost they they are distinct characters, but they they're a package, right? And it is very yeah, much they, intentional. Uh, in the same way that I feel like one drops off as another picks up. They're definitely mirrors of each other because uh, Dipper's trying really hard to be all adult and get Winnie's attention, while Mabel is absolutely bonkers, immature, and out of her mind most of the time without any regard and, for anything. And, and it kind of parallel, it's kind of mirrored, like you said, and that's a good uh, example. In that uh, Dipper is excited to grow up, he's excited to have more responsibilities, he's excited to be more adult. Uh, while Mabel, one of her first reactions about to realizing she's going to be going to high school soon is that her childhood's almost over. There's one time she's upset that uh, she thinks it might be the, her last Halloween dressing up with her brother. Like she's realizing childhood, her childhood is coming to an end. She's going to soon be a teenager. She's going to an adult. They're kind of a uh, mirrors of each other, and it's really nicely done. Yeah, um, let's see. I don't even know where this would fit in, but since you had your gripe with uh, the lack of thriller, I'm going to bring up one thing that I mentioned in an episode. This whole thing with Summerween and how they... <clears throat> like, the subplot here is that Dipper is trying to get to a party that's involving Wendy and the other teens because he wants to hang out with her, so he's trying to fake his way out of going out trick-or-treating and he's constantly looking at his watch and the thing that bugged me here was that they start going out trick-or-treating around 6 o'clock they're in Oregon in the summer and it's dark at 6 what the hell yeah it's very uh, badly done <laughs> that's very bad I mean, it's definitely worst, something a, one of those little continuity seen. things that should have been uh, <laughs> I really dislike that episode worse than the series for me really? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I dislike that episode. I don't care for it either. It's I don't uh, think it's garbage. I didn't mind it. I think the show would be better without it. Um, I find um, it funny that they have this uh, 
they really like they really wanted to do a Halloween episode enough that they like they invented their own holiday for, as an excuse to do it. Because the show is supposed yeah. to take place over the one summer, and if they're ha- in Halloween, mm-hmm. obviously that doesn't fit. I didn't mind the episode much, uh, although I um, there was a point where I thought that the monster, I forget what the monster's name was, I thought there was going to be some crazy plot twist where it was actually Seuss in disguise because of how he disappears a couple of times, but then the monster attacks and Zeus is right there, so yeah. Um, I think it would have been interesting, considering that Seuss is the one that told them of the legend, and yeah, they could have done more with the episode, I guess. Yeah, it's not, it's not a very good one. The show, I don't know if the show would be if it's so bad that it's not like Uncle Grandpa in Steven Universe. Oh no. Like, where the show would be active <laughs> where the show would be actively better without it. That like Uncle Grandpa is a stain on that show. This, yeah. uh, this is just a lackluster episode. I disliked it quite a bit, but I will say that it's not nearly as bad as anything Uncle Grandpa touches. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we'll finally move on to uh, out of characters. Sure, and, uh, I we so, knew that yeah. we were going to get talked. It's just, uh, we were going to get talk about characters for quite a bit. The show is very much. There's a lot of them. A lot of interesting, mm-hmm. good characters. So yeah, uh, intro, intro. Um, it's simple. It's a uh, kind of mystery esque. Yeah, uh, it's, it's good. It's just uh, it fits the, the the theme of the show, the mystery esque. Fi- uh, X-Files feeling of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, it's fun. Uh, I like how all the characters are handled in it. Yeah, it has these title card things uh, like come up and show the names of the characters. And they play with the intro. Uh, if you're one of the types of people who start up an episode of a show and then instantly skip the intro, for the majority of episodes, that's perfectly fine with this. Don't do it near the end. Uh, mm-hmm. The changed up intro. They don't change intros near, uh, like, for seasons, like other shows do. Instead, the intros get the weird at the end when uh, Bill Cipher pops in and starts taking over the world. Yeah, the Weird uh, again in episode uh, intros are altered, so you yeah, don't want to miss that. Really good. Uh, They're a treat. I really enjoyed them. It was really creepy, though. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, it, it, could, it did what it wanted to do. It's really nice. Uh, Mm-hmm. Everything about it was different and changed to Bill Cipher's and his crazy minions uh, instead of the actual cast. It was very, very well done. I had a trip with that. That was great. The intro, I feel like the visuals play a larger role in it than the music does, which is a shame because the music's a good little tune. Yeah, uh... I don't think the music is anything special. I don't particularly like the instrumentation of it. I know you like the whistle. I don't know. I do. I've heard so many fan renditions of the song now that I've seen the show and done some research on it. I've heard several versions, and every fan version I've heard has been better than the original. Yeah. So uh, the melody is definitely strong, but I don't know if the song is really that great. I, I do like it, and I think this is, uh, music's going to be another one of those things that are just really subjective, right? I don't think it's the best oh, version God. of the song. Uh, I, there's a, uh, I'll link it, uh, song that you showed me that's a re- like an electric swing remix of uh, the intro that I think is far superior than the official intro but I still enjoy the original yeah I, I think I have to listen to more of these because I've only heard the 8 bit which you were posting right before we uh, started recording uh, but yeah I, I, I like the, the main official intro yeah one of the one of my nitpicks is uh, as someone who I really enjoy a good intro and sometimes I like you know for me uh, when I'm binge watching a show, the intro is the time to like get up and stretch my legs for a moment, or run across the you know go across the room to pick up something, you know, so I don't miss something. You know, it's something, it's the f- it's the few moments to do something without having and let, while letting the show run without having to worry about missing something. And uh, sometimes I just really like listening to it. And uh, in the later episodes, I I perfectly understand why it's done, but they cut the intro short. And it's right before the good catchy whistling part. It's mm-hmm. sometimes uh, aggravating. You're getting really into it, and you're just about ready for the best, in my part opinion, the best part to drop, and then they skip ahead. It's like, oh man, what a tease. I understand why they did it, because like, the, the plots were getting more in-depth, and they needed more screen time. 
right? And I'm glad they did. I'd rather have a few more minutes to flesh out the plots than uh, the intro every time, but it's just something to be noted. Which, uh, I guess really fits in with the music. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say right now that, uh, the music is, is not very important to me. It's just, it's there. They have, they have little background sounds and background songs. And it's mostly just to, uh, sometimes, uh, less is more. When you barely notice it, it's there. When it's, uh, just very subtly, uh, influences the scene. Sometimes that's just enough. It's not a very important part of the show, at least for me. What do you guys think? Yeah, I guess in the same vein of what I said with Attack on Titan, I didn't really notice the background music much. But I'm guessing that whatever was there fit the scene perfectly. That, yeah. I tend to agree. I actually spent a time rewatching one episode trying to listen for sound effects and background music. I forgot to do it about 10 minutes through. It yeah. just I... is so mundane. I will say, one of the things that caught me off guard was the on the nose music that they composed with the lyrics. Uh, uh, I yeah. got a big laugh out of it the first time they did it, and then the joke died. <laughs> uh, which which one are you uh, talking about? Anytime they use lyrics in a song that they make up that specifically denotes what is going on on screen. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Like uh, the montage scene with the... Mabel yeah. uh, trying to uh, beautify Stan and... Uh... Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, they do that three or four times. They use the same joke. It's very I much... Uh, it. Do you know, um, one of my nitpicks with Attack on Titan was them playing music with lyrics over the the main part of the show. And they did it really poorly, because they, like, they would play music with... In my opinion, anyway. They would play music with lyrics over... Uh, Dialogue that's actually being spoken is a little distracting, right? This show does the same, uh, the plays music with lyrics, but it's handled really well. No, it's over a montage, and it's very much self-referential, like you pointed out. It's very well done. That's how, a good example of how to do it compared to what I feel in Attack on Titan it was kind of poorly handled. I just the only thing I have a problem with is I wish they wouldn't use the same joke four times because yeah. I laughed so hard the first time. I didn't laugh at any other three. I felt bad because it was. It was such definitely a good joke uh, the first time. Uh, they redid the joke a little too much. But yeah, the well, music the and sound on the show was very much. Uh, there's a few good parody songs, but uh, it's mostly there. It's not bad. It's just mm, very passive. Hmm. Passive is a great word for it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's a pretty quick section. Um, well, we already spoke about the voice acting, so... Yeah, there's it, that. We deflated our content a bit. It's fine to shuffle it around, though. It fits equally well in both, yeah. both parts. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Want to talk about some art? Um, yeah. It's very... Yeah. Uh, like, especially with Bill Cipher <laughs> stuff. Let's go back to that for a moment. Uh, His art... And the art of his minions are fucking weird. It's trippy. It's like you're on some kind of drug trip for with Bill and his demons. It's like the shit he does, it's all fucking weird. Oh, yeah. At one point, they actually get inside a rat rod, which I thought was amazing. Yeah, it's... it's The art is weird. <laughs> it's just it's the only way to put it. Like, some of the stuff they I, do is just strange. I love the Weird McGinn stuff. The Weird McGinn stuff is so good, especially the uh, reality bubbles. Oh, mm. so good. It's like, it's, yeah, there's that too, but that's not even... They were doing weird stuff beforehand. Like, the Manitars are just fucking weird. They have fists for nipples. And, like... <laughs> <laughs> it's just a weird show. There's a... It's manly. Yeah. What's more manly than fist nipples? Yeah, it's uh Yeah. Like you want to talk about drug trip, let's talk about when Mabel was uh gorging on Pop Rocks. Uh Yeah. That's what she thinks all the time. Let's be honest. She she just went up to eleven when she's normally on a ten. Well she's Mabel's like gonna grow up to be diabetic, let's all be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she she was eating candy with the wrappers on. <laughs> yeah. She regretted it, but she did it. Yeah. 
So yeah, she was it's... eating raw sugar packets at one point, just sugar <laughs> packets. Yep. But yeah, the art in the show is all really well done. For the most part, it's very strange. But otherwise, uh, they have a lot of attention to detail for a lot of things in the uh, drawn in the background. I know we talked about how there was like plot holes with like continuity wise, like the, why why didn't they use the copier machine? But like with the art, a lot of stuff is very like they pay attention to the details. Like uh, the mystery shack sign is always they try to fix it, but it falls down again. Stan's hand is bandaged. We already talked about that one. There's a time travel episode where they go back in time and it's revealed to all these random little objects that you see in the background of uh, previous episodes were actually left there through the the time travel adventure. Like, a, there's a point where there's a calculator just laying on the ground in a scene in an early episode, and it's not brought up or referenced at all. There's entirely a good chance that you won't even notice the calculator there. But, like, later on when they try and travel back and Mabel drops it, or whatever it is, the calculator or whatever the hell it is, for some reason it's my head, it's a calculator, but, uh, they, uh, they drop it, and if, sure enough, if you go back into the previous, uh, episode and look, it's there. Nice little bits of continuity, um, with the art and the stuff drawn in the backgrounds, and the, the, another thing playing into that with the time travel episode is, uh, blending. Uh, at the the little title card things at the end where they show like little skits, he's shown in the background doing shit. And like if you go back and watch the episodes, he's always like a little extra side character seen in the background. I'm glad I you like brought that. up the backgrounds uh, because I love the attention to detail they put into it. But I think there's a lot of time that backfires because look, they have the opportunity to show off a small town in Oregon. They have all this natural beauty around them. They could really detail the trees, show off the wonder of nature once in a while, but it's always got this emphasis on clutter just to show off these little clues, and that is saddening to me, because I would have loved to see the actual falls. Uh, The end of... I forgot what episode it was. It was the next last, I guess, 19? The end of 19 just shows this brook, this little stream in the woods going, I would have loved to see more of that in the background. Yeah, it's a little missed opportunity. What they do show is really good, though. I'd like mm-hmm. to point that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, and it's how good it is that makes me wish we got more of it, because I don't really care about looking for the letter G in the wood grain of some yeah. tent pole. I would really just love to see the trees draw a little bit better, and more emphasis put on them. And this uh, topic really goes well with another thing we wanted to talk about was the hidden secrets in the show because a lot of it's hidden through the art. Uh, actually, yeah. the majority of it is hidden in the show itself. Like, you'll see, uh, especially anytime Dipper opens up his fucking notebook and it shows a page or his uh, journal and it shows a page, there's something hidden there. Uh-huh. Like, uh huh. This show uh, does a lot with, uh, in, which is a play uh, extension on the play of how Bill Cipher got his name, it does a lot of those ciphers. There's a lot of text in the show that is, just looks like gibberish, but if you apply the right rules to deciphering it, uh, gives you uh, little secret messages or clues about what is going to happen in the episode or later on, or clues about the overarching plot, or... Yeah. yeah, yeah the, or a lot, a lot of it's things. actually little jokes, too. Like, there's one point where um, you look at the page with um, the description of the portal... It says, and if you decipher the thing, there's this big long paragraph. It says, this portal will open up a gateway to infinite power and mystery and all that yada 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 yada. And then it also says, and also maybe get girls to talk to me. <laughs> uh, there's a little, a lot of like little stupid jokes like that. And in fact, most of the uh, little in card uh, secret things are stupid little throwaway jokes. And that's a little disappointing. The secrets. <sighs> Could have been a little bit more meaningful. In some way, that's a good thing, though. But uh, mm, what, do you, what are your thoughts? I gave, gave up, up on it after a while, yeah. Uh, I think that's more for the secrets part, the mystery and the hidden messages part. Because the art in the journal is glorious. I oh, yeah. loved it. Hirsch went out of his way to make that journal amazing. And speaking and of, there, there is a physical version of Journal 3 that you can buy, which we'll talk about in supplemental later media later but yeah that's it's really cool uh the journal in the in the show the every all the bits of art in it are amazing but yeah going back going back to the uh style when it doesn't go out of its way to 
have weird designs. I feel like the style, to me, is painfully bland, which is disappointing. And as an example, you could take any non-named background character from this show, show me that character, I probably wouldn't be able to name what show it's from. Uh, yeah. It's not a bad style, it's just really bland. Airhammer, I know you do a lot of artistic stuff. What's your take on this? Like the artistic design know. of the characters? Oh, well, I, th- I thought everything was just handled well. The visuals were beautiful. Um, I think the first thing that stood out to me outside of Stan's design was uh, Mabel and how she always had kind of this whole pudgy cheek thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, she has braces. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, what else can I say here? There, well, yeah, there, there's a lot to say. It's just how to put it into context. I guess uh, um, one thing to note is that uh, the all the main characters, the characters that you mentioned, that uh, any of the unnamed townspeople that you see, which is not very often, you see them occasionally. They look kind of generic, and I can agree with that. But the characters that aren't those little throwaway townspeople that that you know that Stan is just stealing money from are all very uniquely designed. They all are very unique in their design, the main characters anyway. I agree. Yeah. If, you have a name, if you have a name, you're well designed, you're you're identifiable. If you don't have a name, if you're just walking in the background, I don't know what show you're from. You may as well be from Jimmy Neutron, Power of Up Girls. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's definitely the case. I, th- I think there's one exemption to the background nonsense character, guys, and that's Pete's dude. For some reason, he is stands out <laughs> as a funny design, a joke, every single time I see him. It's almost named. Like, Manly Dan stood out to me uh, at first. <laughs> uh, he's this big, burly lumberjack that likes to punch fish. And I actually had uh, no uh, idea that he was Wendy's father until several episodes later. Because she, uh, she doesn't yeah. even really talk about her family. Um, well, she does. Well, yeah. She sends her a picture of her brothers. About, like, remember how she's talking to us? She's so tall. Oh, uh, yeah. And Dipper calls her a freak. But, yeah. yeah you You put it really well. If you're named, you get you, you have a lot of attention to detail in your character design. Not so if you're not named, you might as well just I might have well just been one of those shady background characters, uh, like just a silhouette, like in the early episodes of Ruby. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, I don't know what else is there to say about the art. Um, it, when it does do uh, outside scenes of the, the the Oregon forests, it's really great, like you said. Oh um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you guys a question because this has been nagging me since I saw a piece of fan work, which I guess now that I'm mentioning it, we'll put it in the the uh, doobly doo down below the video on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, so, do you think the characters show enough emotion in their faces? Because that's one of the main benefits of animation is that you can show emotion magnified. I saw a uh, anime remake of the Pacifica Northwest uh, mini golf scene at the end of the episode where she's mm-hmm. in the car. Yeah. Uh, the facial expressions in that scene in the anime style felt so much more authentic and so much more readable than the ones in the actual show, which had me re examine everything I thought about the characters' faces in the show. I am not sure anymore if they really use the animation to its best or not. Mm. I think um, my answer to this is going to be very similar to when you brought it up in uh, Steven Universe, in that uh, I don't really notice it that much. I didn't maybe it's I saw maybe it's different like personality type things, but I don't. Maybe I don't. I I get the ideas of how people are feeling emotions in shows more through uh, what people are saying and what uh, music might be playing or the setting or like the colors than I do. Facial expressions. I, facial expressions are obviously really important, but like I think this might be. I can agree with you. It's very suffers from the same thing like Steven Universe did. It's very basic. It's similar. It's, uh, it's Steven Universe got the emotions down the, the characters' faces though. When Pearl was worried or panicking, you could see it in her face. When yeah, she, no. she was excited. You, the smile was there. I don't know if that carries over as well in Gravity Falls, and that's a shame because until I saw a fan work. To compare it to, I didn't notice this at all. I guess uh, blissful ignorance is to blame on this one, but I can't really unsee how 
the characters don't emote enough now. Yeah, I uh, definitely think it could be uh, made better. I think a lot of people pick up on stuff like this in different ways. Some people might notice not notice it as evidently as uh, others. It's an interesting yeah. topic. Well, I didn't pick it up until I saw that yeah. different version. And that made, had me thinking how great that scene was. Then I went back to watch the scene. It wasn't as good. <laughs> yeah, like I think I picked up on the emotions in the main show. And I've also seen the anime variation. And it was really good. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I have I to think, watch it. I think you guys like the anime. I just never got around to watching it. I believe there's another one out there from the same guy. Uh, I forget what scene it is though, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's really uh, good. There is as much uh, as I can find in the show notes, the comments. Speaking of, there is uh, a little bit put into the art in that um, has really interesting stuff with uh, guest arts, guest artists. In a way, uh, there's like this whole there's a character and an uh, episode based on it, but he recur- reoccurs later of a character who's in a uh, Street Fighter esque parody game, and it's all done pixel art. It's really nice. There's also uh, the two anime boyfriend <laughs> characters that Mabel yeah. invents into existence or whatever. From what I don't, I think it's supposed to be from some manga she reads or something. I think Tyler it's. And Jess? Yeah, I think it's supposed to be a play on the gem cartoon, if they were the male equivalent. Uh, it's just in the way that they dress, uh, they talk, and their look about them. It's like if you mixed Ken from Barbie, but made him a gem character or something. Uh, this for is some what... reason, they feel very uh, 90s to me. They're intentionally out of style, and I love it about them. They're actually from some Dream Boy VHS she has. Oh, uh, Okay. But yeah, uh, the guest artists are something that's done interesting in this game. Uh, the guest art styles, I guess. I know uh, they worked with uh, other people for the uh, pixel yeah. pixel art he, stuff. I'm he not did sure about the others. Too. The same guy who animated Rumble also animated Giffany. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's really well done. Beautiful pixel art. Mm-hmm. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so let's finally move on to Hidden Secrets. Yeah, let's continue. Yeah, I guess one thing you disliked about them, especially the the, the end of the screen or the end of the show uh, secrets, I I kind of find not necessarily good, but something of note. They're fun, but they're not needed to enjoy it. Like, there's no gigantic weird plot holes that like just don't make sense if you don't decipher shit. Right? That would have been horrible, and I'm glad that they didn't handle it that way. Like, there's nothing stupidly important hidden away in the notes that would just make the show incomprehensible or unenjoyable if you didn't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think that's why I enjoyed just letting them go aside, because you were giving me uh, translations for yeah. decryptions of each message after the episode. Yeah, and... and uh, I think I went through about a dozen, and I realized none of these are relevant. One of them is a flat-out lie. Well, we'll probably put a link to the wikia page that has all the um translations if you watch the show because it's interesting to look at but yeah the secrets there's a lot of them there's a lot of ciphers there's a lot of like shift all the letters to the left a couple of spaces or replace these letters with this one or they'll be listed as numbers and you have to replace the numbers with letters uh, there's also uh, a lot of sounds that if played backwards give you hints about other things there's also a lot of stuff that is just plain jokes like one of the chants that gideon does uh, sounds like gibberish, but and when you play it backwards, it just says, backwards message, backwards message. This show does a lot of stuff with hiding little things. It's interesting, it's neat, it adds to the charm of the show, but it's not necessary to enjoy it. What do you guys think about the secrets in the show? Well, I remember how Days was picking out numbers throughout the first uh, many episodes. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. The numbers sure. gave me a feeling of what the first timers who were watching it may have felt because I noticed every episode seemed to have a number it focused on. Six eighteen came up a lot. Apparently, that's Hersh's birthday or something like that. I'm yeah. not exactly sure, but it showed up enough that I heard about that somewhere in my research. There was a lot of other numbers. Uh, the number of disposable cameras Dipper had. Every episode has this weird number to it. You can't really yeah. escape it. And I think that's fun. I don't think it really adds up to anything, but it's interesting because I was picking up on that as if it were clues. So I kind of get the way first-timers felt, but I don't think the mystery is there anymore. Now that you can't engage with a community without spoiling yourself, it's gone. And Yeah, it's definitely something... Uh, 
but there's some shows that you might just not be able to experience the same way anymore. Like, I this is absolutely one of them. This is one of them because of the secrets and stuff in it. Like, and it's still an enjoyable show, but I wonder how many other shows I'm gonna feel the same way about. Like, like say we brought someone in for the Pokemon episode, right? And has like no real uh, insight to what it is. They're not going to experience it in the same way that people that grew up with it is, you know. Uh, there's going to be a... who knows the game, or the cards, or any of the other yeah. media. There's also going to be stuff like um, somewhat tainted. Like I am, I'm not sure how I'm going to feel about. Uh, and I guess I'll talk about this later. But Transformers, it's already been lined up as one of our next four shows, and I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to feel about it because I've already seen the movie the animated movie, and I've seen, uh, you know, a couple of the live-action movies, I think two of them. But, uh, my expectations are already, you know, skewed or tainted, and I know of the characters I've, you know, it's gonna be interesting. I think that well, should be, it's worth to, noting, talking about. Yeah. It comes out to a few factors. This one, that the mystery in particular is part of the first-time viewing experience. Being able to engage with other people, and point out clues to one another and share that experience is certainly something the fans that were watching it when it first aired got to enjoy that you can't anymore. If you go looking for that, you will spoil yourself for what it all meant in the end because of spoiler. And what it, it, it dilutes the value of the mystery. I never got engaged in the mystery of it because I knew if I tried to, I was either on my own doing a lot of work that someone else has already done were spoiling myself. I yeah. didn't feel like at any point I could get that same satisfaction of working with other people to find out the next clue. And that's not something anyone's ever going to be able to recapture. Yeah, it's going to be really, really hard to recapture the feeling of when the show was new and there was a lot of unanswered questions. And I think that's going to be the same for ever. That's In a way, that's the same for a lot of shows, right? Yeah, yeah, secrets did you want to pipe in on the mystery and secrets? Uh, to be honest, I didn't really concentrate on it so much. Um, I wasn't really looking at all the background stuff. Like like we mentioned that uh, if you go back to certain episodes, you will see things that were mentioned in later episodes. And I never caught on to that because I was so focused on just what was right in front of me, not in the background. Yeah, to I guess honest, a lot of the uh, secrets and Easter eggs are better appreciated on a second viewing Maybe so. I have not viewed the entire series a second time. Uh, I think that seeing everything at face value is probably the preferred experience for first-timers. I tried to look into it deep. I ended up with a lot of dead ends because I couldn't communicate um, on the same level that people did when they first aired the episodes. Yeah. I definitely think it's going to be something you're not going to be able to experience for the first time like it did before, but it's still neat. It's neat that it happened. I guess that's... Well, well, I'm disappointed and a little sad that I won't be able to experience it, and I can't experience it like those pe first people did. Like you said, it's hard not to spoil yourself while trying to. I'm glad that the people who did got to do it that way. I'm glad that they decided to do this little thing with it. That's neat. Uh, and different. I wish Hirsch would have not nearly killed himself over it, but yeah, yeah it's pretty great he... that people were able to <laughs> enjoy it that much. But yeah, uh, I guess, <laughs> where do you want to move the conversation now? Comparisons, Comparison. inspirations, influences? Yeah, everything I had to say about the mystery had already been said, except for that last little bit, so please move on. Yeah, uh, obviously, for me, like I said earlier, it feels like X-Files, like a kid's version of X-Files. Like, <laughs> there's, you know, a lot of parallels with, like, uh, having a seemingly, or in this case, seemingly skeptical, char skeptical character, Stan, with a person that wants to believe everything, Dipper. Uh, later, it's obviously revealed that Stan wasn't actually, but it has that kind of parallel at the beginning. Mulder and Scully mm -hmm. type thing. Uh, there's a lot of Monster of the Week stuff going on, but like always a little sprinkling of uh, background uh, plot, moving the plot forward, right? I enjoy that parallel. I, I think it's very uh, evident... Uh, at least to me. Uh, what do you guys think? I I have an entire list of shows that this has influences from. I've seen things from 
a little bit from X Files, but I'm not super familiar with that show. Uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. I think I mentioned that in my expectations. There was some of that in there. Twin Peaks. There's a lot. Oh of yeah. Twin Peaks. Lots of Eldritch horror, especially with Weird Mageddon. Scooby Doo. I mentioned that. Ghostbusters. Oh yeah. There's definitely some uh, Ghostbusters. That's in another good one. Possibly some Grim Adventures and Billy and Mandy. Uh, there's some cross pollination since it was made at the same time as Rick and Morty with uh, that show. That's one of the funnest little Easter eggs. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Okay, uh, so I've go got ahead. I got a question to ask you because I am not familiar at all with this, but I was wondering if it was related, and then I've got one bombshell that I think this show shares such a tremendous influence of that I couldn't stop seeing it. First of all, okay. does this show have a lot in common with Goosebumps? Uh, maybe not so much. I mean, Goosebumps has a kind of a story of the week, or you know, each ep- this, there's not a re- big recurring arc in Goosebumps at all. They're not linked in any way. Each book is totally separate. I mean, they might have passing references to each other, but in the way that it's kind of campy monster of the weekiness, yeah, I guess. But um, no, I wouldn't say as a whole. Uh, I was curious because I never actually watched the show, um, and I. Didn't oh, I was know thinking the books. I really much. haven't seen the show all that much, but I was thinking the books. Um, okay, Airhammer, say this. Have you seen Goosebumps? Is there any relation? <sighs> I have seen a handful of episodes many, many years ago. Um, the possessed uh, Halloween mask, I guess, being the one that stuck out the most to me. And I can't see a lot of parallels between the two from what little I know. Okay. So probably not very Goosebumpsy unless we miss something. We are we don't know Goosebumps because it's live action and we're animated indulgence. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it was something I wanted to ask because it was something that came to mind. It isn't the right time to influence Hirsch, but apparently it didn't really creep into the show enough to stand out. One yeah. of the things that I know for a fact stood out and molded this show into part of what it is is The Simpsons. Because of the way the town works. Because of the way you have so many side characters that you know. Mm-hmm. Every little side character is named in the same way. In the same way that Springfield is a town with its own identity, Gravity Falls is a town with its own identity. I think, uh... So, that is where I see The Simpsons influence so heavily. Yeah, I can agree with that. Uh, it's a very memorable town of characters. And I think, uh... I'm surprised you didn't mention this before in the, uh... The Steven Universe episode, because it has kind of the same feel. It's got some of that, but... I don't feel like it's the same way. It doesn't have the same relationship. Like, for instance, uh... We only know a few people in town... We don't know that Lars and Connie even have knowledge of each other's names, right? Okay, fair enough. We're in, we're in Gravity Falls. These people have been living with each other. They go to the same diners. They know each other very well. There's that township relationship, and that is such a core part of this show that I feel like was... Yeah, I get, yeah, I could definitely get behind that. I see what you mean. Because, like, Steven Universe kind of fell behind on that a little bit. Like, they even point to it in uh, an episode where Connie's like, um, I don't know if we've officially met Lapis or whatever. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, ex- exactly. And yeah, I can see what you're that's... I guess we already talked about it a little bit, but uh, there's another thing I want to bring up in this section, and that, uh, just the hammer at home, because I already talked about it, but, uh, it... It's def- definitely very much influenced by Oregon and its uh, mystery shop esque, or you know, the the mystery shack is very much inspired by like um, touristy trap areas here in town. Like, uh, I know this doesn't quite fit, but like, because this is an amusement park, but it feels fits into the same kind of example. But like, there's a place where I used to go to uh, as a kid called the Enchanted Forest, and it was a uh, little mini, like super small. Uh, theme park. It had like a roller coaster, a cup thing, a little mini roller coaster, a little like cup twirl thing, and like a Ferris, like a mini Ferris wheel. Right? It's not exactly the same, but it very much reminds me of 
the mystery shack. There's also, like like I mentioned before, like I could I can go a couple towns over and actually go to a wax museum. I don't know. It's very, it feels very authentic to that type of uh, area, that type of the, the region it's supposed to be representing. And also obviously I've talked about the forested backgrounds and stuff as well. Um, well I'm so, yeah. glad to hear that because around here none of that stuff is the case except for the forest. I do see quite a lot of pine trees, but I never seen anything quite like the mystery shack. And I was wondering if that was just an oddity or something that they picked up from. There's, it's definitely that. a thing in uh, in central, south central. I'd say from like the middle of the state, you know, draw a line from the left to the right of the middles you know, across the middle of the state down into like northern California. It's definitely a thing, like little touristy shop things where you, they sell things. It's also a very sideshow, uh, you know, carnival sideshow esque, and like people, you know, stand in the show t- like taped together creatures to make new weird sideshow creatures. Um, I don't know to the extent that stuff like that actually happens, but the people definitely make up fake exhibits that are people know and willingly go to just to see for the kookiness, knowing that they're fake. Yeah, it feels very authentic. I like it. Especially since I... I that's a, another layer of the charm for me particular, you know, is... I live in Oregon and it feels, you know, like a super exaggerated version of home. <laughs> Maybe one day they'll set a show near where I live, and I can give that same sort of input. Yeah. But yeah, I guess. So shall we move on to uh, our uh, supplemental media? Please oh. do. Yeah, it's pretty uh, straightforward. There's a series of like, I don't know how many in total. Maybe twenty in total. Uh, shorts. They take place between season one and two. A seri- a chunk of them uh, follow Mabel doing, like, g- guide-to-life type things. Uh, but she's bad at them. Uh, or sure. weird, she's does them in a weird way. <laughs> she's very much Mabel in them. Uh, there's also saying, uh, fixing it with Seuss. Um, yeah. Which is supposed to be edited by Seuss. So, like, there's bad artifact, like... Like, uh, oh, that's ghosting. Just and sh- oh, it's I so love good. that. Yeah, I, I feel like for the minute to minute value, you get more comedy out of the shorts than you do the actual show. Oh, yeah. Um, the shorts are great. Um, there's another one where Dipper is uh, investigating certain lo- a different creature each day. I would like to point out that this is probably the, the shorts have the best examples of the secrets in the show for the fact that they're the. It's, it's where it's easiest to actually get information on them. Imagine where, like, you can't really get on the internet and uh, search up a bunch of shit about, like, what was just put on the thing. It, it might be harder to access screenshots of, like, the little flashes of codes and shit in the actual episodes, right? But since these are uh, the the medium that they're in, they're on YouTube or they're on their the video player online, you, it's really easy to and see the messages. They're really easy to access. And it, each of the shorts do have hidden secrets that pertain to the main show. But yeah, uh, other than that, the other, other supplemi- supplemental media I know of is uh, they made a physical version of Journal 3 that has both Bill, or, or not, uh, that has both uh, Dipper's and uh, Stanf- Stanford's uh, notes written into them. It's all done to make it look like it's an actual like thing that was written in and drawn in. It, it looks really good. Yeah, the show doesn't really have that much supplemental media. There's an interview with the creator, and that's basically it, really. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's so new, and since this is finished, there's not a lot to it. Those shorts really can't be overstated enough that they are delightful and practically a season 1.5. I really, really suggest watching them. And we'll have a link to a playlist um, with all the supplemental media, obviously. Yeah, so I guess we should move on to final thoughts, unless you had something to say about the media, Air Hammer? No, nope, nothing that really stands out. You know more than I do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> hey there, this is Majoric from the Future, and if you're wondering why I'm sound different, it's because I'm on a brand new microphone, but that's besides the point. I'm here to talk about video games and why we forgot to talk about them in the main recording. And it's pretty simple. 
Karate Falls doesn't have much in the way of video games. It has a kind of shovelware 3DS platformer. It looks kind of crap. And it also has a Flash game that is basically a Zelda clone. It looks kind of meh at best. So, uh, yeah, final thoughts. Um, who wants to start? I just I just really liked it. And like I said before, I really feel that a sequel or a movie is definitely set up for it. Like, it kind of ends on that bit of a cliffhanger even though it finishes. Like, yeah. Dip, Dipper is invited to come back for the next summer. We know that Stanley and Stanford are out tackling other monsters. We had... I have the theory about Bill being locked somewhere in Grunkle Stan's mind, and he could return at any moment. Anything uh, could happen. <laughs> yeah, it's... I, I'd like... To, yeah, it's very... One of the highlights... One of the good points of this show, in my opinion, and it's going to be a weird thing to say, maybe... But I really liked the fact that it's finished. It knew what it was going to do. It had everything planned out. It knew the story it wanted to tell. It told it. It got to the end. It summed it up. I mean, say what you will about the ending with like erasing the mind and having no consequences. But the rest of the ending is all really good. Touch, touching, and like mm-hmm. characters have progression and it's nice and it's done. It's like I wonder. I'm gonna wonder how a lot of people feel about this. If, if, I want to hear some feedback about that. By the way. Do you guys like complete shows, or do you like shows that keep going on and over, on and on and on and on, like a shonen, like they never end? They always have more material. I'll be oh. blunt. If they had not had Weird and Again, and had a weaker season finale, and carried on to season three, four, five, whatever, I don't think I'd continue watching the show. I enjoyed it, but I don't think I would have continued. The fact that they gave me such a great finale cements it for me as a more enjoyable piece of media. Yeah, I can agree with that. I think that uh, I might not stop watching entirely like you would, and I and I wouldn't begrudge or blame anyone who would have stopped at that point. I might have continued watching if they kept up at least some decent quality. Uh, but the show is better for the fact that they ended. And I'm hoping this is a good example for how shows that I'm currently invested in might end. Like, uh, say, Ruby or Steven Universe or any show I might become attached to over the series of this uh, podcast. I'm hoping other shows can follow this show's good example of knowing when to end itself before you lose my interest. Mm. Hmm. My opinions are that it's a flawed show, but that doesn't hold it back from being a good show. It's very good. A lot of how good it is to you will depend on how emotionally invested you can get in the characters, but they give you a lot of leeway on that. It's not the hardest thing to do. It's still a family show, but it's perfect as a family show. It's very, very solid. I don't think it's going to give you any uh, real insight the way something like Adventure Time would, where you could really examine it and get some self-exploration out of it, but the entertainment value is there, and there's certainly enough on the main plot to really enjoy it. Yeah, and uh, I agree with pretty much everything you say there, except for I think that uh, what you might take away from it, like we already talked about a bit earlier, might depend on your some of your circumstances in life. Like, I think Airhammer and I took a bit more away from it with uh, the siblings thing. It certainly yeah. seems that way. Because I have in no way a negative opinion of it, but I definitely seem to have a lower estimation of the show than you two. Mm. I do recommend the show. I think it should be on a lot of people's watch lists. I don't see anything that makes it jump up to the point where I say put it near the top of your watch list. Just put it on your list wherever you want it. It'll be there. Yeah, I, I like the way um, it ended. Uh, if it were to stop now, I'd be satisfied. Obviously, you know, you have the, the main plot and theme of the show being done during a summer break, so obviously it has to end somewhere. You can't really drag it on for too long. If they were to introduce a third season or a movie that took place in the next summer or a summer, uh, I would love it, sure. I would check it out. Um, but, yeah, I, I like where it left off. The way the show ended, it felt like leaving summer camp. There was this bittersweet moment, and the ending music felt like some 80s coming-of-age movie. It really was a coming-of-age story in the end for Dipper and Mabel. Oh, definitely. I think that added so much weight to the show. I loved the ending, other than Bill Cipher. (laughs) I, I cannot say how much I wish 
that Bill Cipher had just been a bit character, and I wish that Gideon had made some sort of less world-ending threat that they still overcame and had some real consequences to, it would have been more enjoyable for me. But what they did, how they presented it, the ending was very, very, very good. Yeah. I Yeah, like I said, I really love this show. It means a lot of the themes and little character arcs are hit home very hard for me. Um, yeah, I really enjoy the show. I'm And again, I'm glad it ended. And I would definitely recommend it to uh, anyone who likes little mystery shows. Like little, a show with a bit of mystery to it. So, uh, final, yeah. final, final thoughts? I don't know. I think I've said watch most it. of what I want to say. Yeah, watch <laughs> it. Give it a shot. All right. Well, then I guess I'll have the last words in here, if you guys don't mind. Sure. Yeah. Reality's illusion. The universe is a hologram. Bye, gold. Bye. Bye.